So let's, uh, let's look now at Romans chapter 9. We're actually going to try and see how far we can get done today. Uh, we have a long ways to go. But uh, I wanted us to consider some, some issues here that are very important, setting up for chapter 12. I mean, everything, everything moves us in a direction where Paul is very consistent and organized in the way he plans things out, and he knows where he's going, and he knows what he wants to accomplish. He even answers his own questions, asks some questions, and answers them in the book of Romans. And here we come to the issue of Israel in chapters 9 through 11. And, and the issue that you're going to see in all of these verses is that God is in charge. God is sovereign. The theological term we use is sovereign, that he rules over everything. Nothing is a surprise to God. Isn't that good to know, even in your life, that there are no surprises to God? You can't go to prayer and say, God, were you aware of this? And him, and him say to you, uh, no, that happened? I mean, can you actually imagine that? Several days ago, I got an, uh, a text from somebody uh, off of YouTube watching a video I did on YouTube, and he made some charge that I said that God is all-knowing, and he said, if God is all-knowing and free, he can't be all-knowing and be free at the same time. Ha, huh, God isn't all-knowing. And I thought, wow, that was an intelligent argument. Let me think about that. People aren't, don't like the idea that God is all-knowing. They don't like the idea that he could know the future. But for us, it gives us great peace to know that God is in charge, right? And the trouble we go through, he's in the midst of it. The illnesses we have, the struggles we have, the, the, the fights we might have with life and, and sin and all that, God's in charge. And so he comes to Israel and he talks about, uh, prior to this chapter 9, remember, he has talked about life, that everyone is a sinner. He said that everyone's going to hell everyone's going to be judged for their sin and all of us are sinners and all of us need forgiveness and then he talks about a wretched man that we are and that he was and that we are and we talked about how you can't get to the glory of chapter 8 until you know the misery of chapter 7 and the frustration of trying to live the, the Christian life he gets to 8 and he says that the Holy Spirit is the only way this is accomplished and then he begins to talk about Israel and God's sovereignty and what's really interesting in the idea that Israel is rejected is that Jesus came and died as an Israelite, as a Jew, and they rejected him. They did not accept him. They still don't. The Jew, Jews do not see Jesus as the Messiah. They do not accept him at all. They have rejected him. Now, what I liked is that, look at verse 15 in chapter 9. Let's look at just quickly at some things in this chapter. In verse 15, it's in... And, and, uh, Paul is going to quote Moses, and he says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And those are fighting words for some people. That God would say, I want to have mercy on you, and not on someone else. That isn't fair. That isn't fair, <laughs> is it? But I look at it in a way differently. I look at it as we are people who have sinned, who have the place in our lives where we need someone to come and rescue us. Now, if you don't see the need for rescue, you don't see how good it is that God has chosen you. If you can't see that you need rescuing, that you are in deep trouble, those people down in Joplin, deep trouble, they need help. So we've gone a little bit, others have gone, a lot have gone, and people have gone to Joplin and said, we're here to help you. And there are people there saying, I don't really want your help. And there are others that say, they have nowhere to live. I have nothing. Everything is gone. Look where my house is. There's nothing left. And whatever is around is destroyed. Those people know they need help, Right? You know what it was like here in Independence the week after when the sirens started going off? There were a lot of people saying, I'm going to the basement for the first time. Because they saw the devastation in Joplin and it could happen here. And they realized that. And so they took all the kids and they put them in the halls and they put them in the basements. And for an hour and a half, the kids are crying. We're going to die, one kid said at one school. We're going to die. We're going to die. Why? Because they saw the devastation. I wonder 
if people could see the devastation that will happen in their lives without Christ and how terrible it really is and going to be for them and how life is not good without Jesus, how life living is not good enough without him. Then you go into the church and you have people who just say, well, I, I said a little prayer when I was a kid and I'm just fine. And there is no sense of devastation, no sense of how horrible life is without Christ and the need for forgiveness. Israel comes along and says, we don't like this Jesus. We don't like this Messiah. We don't like it. And they rejected him. And God says, well, I'll choose whoever I want. I'll choose whoever I want. And I look at that and I say, here we are, all of us, when these guys went this last week to Joplin, they had to walk into a mess everywhere. And they had to pick out one guy and say, okay, we're going to help that one guy. Why him? Why him? Well, I don't know. There's devastation everywhere. Why him? Why you? Why did God choose you? Why did God reach down into all the devastation of life around and choose you? Because God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And it's God's choice. I don't think he looks down and says, oh, there's somebody I really could like. That's not how God chooses. He doesn't look at us and say, you're so wonderful. He looks down and he just says, I'm going to take that one out. Of, and I'm going to take that one out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that one out. And I'm going to take that one out. Now look what else he says. In verse 16, it says, It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. It does not depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. You get a hold of that, and it will excite you that God has chosen you, and you don't deserve it. We don't deserve God's choosing us, do we? We don't earn it at all. And God did not look down and say, oh, there's somebody who trusts me, I'll pick them. God does not do that. He comes down and he says, everybody deserves to be wiped off the map. Every one of us deserve to die. And that's what he has been saying in Romans. Everyone's a sinner. Everyone deserves to, be, to die. However, God's going to show mercy on whom he's going to show mercy. God's going to give you grace. It isn't grace if you did something for it. It isn't a gift if you did something for it. You come to my house, you help me do something, I give you lunch. Because you help me. Grace is I give you lunch because you didn't do anything. I just love you. Grace is God giving because we don't deserve it. Now you start getting that in your spirit, you didn't deserve it, you're headed for hell, you're headed for destruction, and all of a sudden, things start to change in the way you view things. And Paul is going to say here, this is all of God, this is none of you. Now look at verse 19. He says, one of you will say to me, then why does God blame us? How can God say, I'll have mercy on whom I'm going to have mercy. I'm going to choose some and not everyone. And then those I didn't choose, I'm going to blame and say, you're going to hell. Now what right, what right does God have to do what right does God have to say that or to send some to hell? There are some people that look at this problem and just say, you know what, that's, done, that's not fair. You really don't want to mess with God in the area of fair. Don't go to God and say, that's not fair. If you're into fairness, lots of kids are into fairness, aren't they? Have you ever noticed how kids will say, that's not fair. He gets to stay up later than I do. <gasps> Let's do fair. You all can go to bed at 7. Oh, I'm not. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't mean that fair. See, we don't really want fair. Nobody really wants fair. Fair when it comes to God is that everyone goes to hell. That's fair. What's fair is punishment for everyone. That's fair. If God looks down and says, everybody's going to die, but I'm going to choose a few to keep from dying. That's God's choice. Isn't that his prerogative to do that? Isn't that his right to do that? And then here's what Paul says in response to this question. He says, for who, who, who resists his will? But who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Show what is formed, say to him who formed it. Why did you make me like this? In verse 21, does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? 
He says, what right do we have to say anything to God? He says, his stuff, his world, his universe. If he sees the sin around us and the punishment for that sin is death and separation from him and decides that some people can go to heaven and some he will redeem, that's his right. Now, he says all of this about Israel. He talks then about Israel being, because Israel rejects Jesus, because Israel rejects Jesus, you and I, you and I are able to, to know him. We're able to know Christ because of the Jews' rejection of him. He says, fine. You guys don't want it? I'm going to those who haven't heard. I'm going to those people who haven't even been told. I'm going to the people that don't even know I even exist. I'm going to show them. Now, what's interesting in Romans chapter 9 is he actually says to, Israel, to the Israelites, and God did this so that you would be jealous. So that the Jews would look and say, but we're the chosen people. We're the chosen people. And those Gentiles are going to heaven, and he's going to produce some jealousy in them. See, God has still chosen Israel. They're still his people. Now, I don't think all of Israel is going to get saved, some think. Look in, look in verse 28. Now, verse 27, Isaiah writes, Though the number of the Israelites be like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. There is a remnant of Jews. They'll look, they'll see, and they'll turn. And Paul wants you to know today that you have a special calling from God. Because the chosen people have chosen not to follow, God has gone out and said, you I will choose. Now, don't worry about when God did all of that. When is not important. If it is important to you, he did it before you were ever here. And in his heart and mind, since he sees past and present and future is all the same, then it's all in his heart and it's all a done deal. And it, to him it matters not when. All you know is that God reached out and said, I want you. I want you. I want you. I want you to have a relationship with me. I want you to give your life to me. I want you to know me. I want you to have my spirit in you. I want you to live with me forever. I want you. And you are special to God. Israel is special. But they demonstrated unbelief. And God rejects them. Look at uh, chapter 10 and verse 19. Again, I asked, did Israel not understand First Moses said, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And then Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I've held out my hands to a dis disobedient and obstinate people. He looked at Israel and he said, they're disobedient and obstinate. I'm going to reach out to those who don't even know I'm around. That's you. Now you stand back and think about the awesomeness of this and got how God has chosen you out of a mess of devastation and said, I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to give you eternal life. I'm going to give you life. Then you ought to stand back and go, oh my, oh my. God, thank you. There's far too little, far too little gratefulness today. And I think there's far too little gratefulness today because there's m way too little understanding of God's sovereignty and his choosing of us. Far too often have we said, I know I'm saved because I said a prayer very little of I'm saved because God caught me because God ran after me because God chose me because God grabbed me out that God took me out of the fire that God took me out and grabbed me and pulled me out and placed me in Christ and I am in him now and it's not because of me it's because of him far too little glory for God in our lives. Way too much look at me. 
in our life. Chapter 11 now, uh, Paul begins to talk about the future glory for Israel and that there will be a coming back and Israel will come back to him. And then there's this uh, doxology, and I want you to look at it. And I'm going to read it from uh, New King James. I like it better than King James because it doesn't have the these and thous. I like it better than NIV because I like the way it's worded better. But I want you to, you can follow along. The doxology is in chapter 11, verse 33. Once he has talked about Israel and his love for Israel and talked about the fact that he's chosen us as Gentiles, and pulled us out of the devastation and sin and pulled us out of a life of godlessness and a life that was going to end in death. Then he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who knows the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him? And it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. God. Glory forever. You will never comprehend and understand all that he is and does and why. You can only get a little glimpse. And you bow on your knees and you say, Oh God, you are so fantastic that you would reach down and grab this sinner and forgive him. That you would pull him out and love him that much. I don't understand that. I don't ever, I, I can't comprehend that. That God would do that for me, for you. Oh, the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, far beyond our understanding. So he ends chapter 11 with that. Then he starts chapter 12, therefore. So basically, I've set you all up. You know. When you see the word therefore, you see what it's there for. And you look back and say, when Paul makes a conclusion, and then he says, therefore, He's saying, I told you all of this, and I have a reason for this. So I've set you all up this morning and said to you that God has said, I have chosen you. You are special. You are mine. You don't deserve it. There's nothing you can do to get it. Understanding me is beyond your ability. Understanding how and why is beyond anything. All you can do is bow your knee. Therefore, since you have been chosen, since God has shown you great mercy that you did not deserve, look what he writes in verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So what is the response of the heart? What is the response of the heart when you see that God has chosen you out of his mercy? What is the response of a person's life? Well, it is worship. It is that we bow down to him and we worship him. We sang, how great thou art. I mean, really think about it. The God who created the whole universe has chosen you. How great you are, God. How great thou art. William Temple was the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury in 1940, from 1942 to 1944. He is regarded as a great man of faith, a great man who loved God with all of his heart during a very perilous time, obviously, in England, during the Second World War. Listen to what he wrote about worship. He said, worship is the submission of our nature to God. It is the quickening of our conscience by his holiness, nourishment of mind by his truth, purifying of imagination by his beauty, opening of the heart to his love, submission of will to his purpose, and all is gathered up in adoration 
is the greatest of human expressions of which we are capable. Worship involves our minds, our conscience, our imagination, our heart, and our will. It's an awesome statement about worship. Here's what we think worship is. How great thou art. Now, there's nothing wrong with singing, but that is such a minor part of worship. And yet we call it the worship service. And we say, I was worshiping today. My goodness, if all you do in worship is sing a song, you are not even close. The worship and the singing is a portion of it, but it is a small portion. It ought to be the vocal expression of it, but worship is much more than that. You have just spoken worship, but you've not lived it just by singing. It's why so many people in our generation now, younger generation, 20-somethings or more or so in that, that area, why they're able to go out and get drunk on Saturday night and come in and worship on Sunday morning. How they're able to be mean and horrible all week at work, but come in and worship and act like nothing's different and everything's fine. It's because they have separated worship from a change in their character. Their minds are not worshiping. Their hearts are not worshiping. Their submission and their will is not worshiping. Nothing is worshiping except their voice. It's empty. That's not what Paul says here. Paul says when he says, Therefore, because you have been chosen, get on your knees and give something. Right? The basis for our, our submission to him, the basis for our worship, is not the great things he does for us. He does a lot of good things. It is not because we are moved emotionally, but that's okay. It's okay to feel. It is not that we think he's such a wonderful God. Look what Paul says, the basis for you and me to absolutely worship him. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, I guess sisters too, because of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, not for what you're going to get out of it, Oh, I know if I just submit everything to Jesus, if I just give him all, then, then I'll get all this stuff. Oh, wait a minute. That's not the motivation and basis for worship. The motivation and basis for worship is the mercy God has shown us, that he's forgiven us, that he's cleansed us, that he sent his son for us, that without him reaching down and choosing us, we would be lost. We would die. And because he has chosen us, we stand back and we say, wow, you have done this for me. I bow my life to you. The basis is God's mercy. You see, so often we preach a gospel of, if you would just get saved, God will take care of all your trouble. And we get saved, why? So we can get something from God. And you even say to Christians, you know, what? If you, if you would just... Give everything to Jesus. Just turn it over to him. Life would be so much better. Maybe you should turn it over because there's a merciful God who could kill you if you didn't. The motivation for, for worship, real worship, is the sovereignty of God over life and everything. There is so little sense of his sovereignty and so much selfishness today. Little sense of his sovereignty too much sense of what I want and what I need. And so Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, offer your bodies a living sacrifice. The basis for our consecration is God's mercy. The extent of it is everything we have. You say, if you really want to be a servant of his, if you really want to respond the way Paul is talking here, and you see how merciful God has been and how much he has forgiven you, and you see the depth of his, uh, how far he was willing to go, watch the passion of Jesus sometime when you're just feeling a little bit hard in your heart. Watch how much Jesus suffered for you, suffered for me. Watch and see how much he physically suffered, emotionally suffered, and spiritually suffered. Watch that, and you're just a glimpse of God's mercy for you. 
I can't watch that thing without crying. I can't watch it without crying. Can you? I can't do it. That God would love us that much. That he would suffer that much. And what does he ask in return? Everything. Everything. So Paul says, offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. The extent of our consecration has to be everything. That means God is looking to rule your mind. He's looking to rule your emotions. He's looking to rule your bodies. He's looking to rule your ambitions. He's looking to rule your future. He's looking to rule your relationships. He's looking to rule your de desires, your passions. He looks to rule everything, and either he will rule it all or he's not ruling. Say, well, I have most things submitted to him. No, you're not submitted. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. I'm working on it. It doesn't work that way. Being submitted to Christ is saying, you rule every choice I make. You rule the jobs I have. You rule the future I have. You rule what I read. You rule what I watch. You rule what I drink. You rule what I eat. You rule everything about me. That's what Paul's talking about. It is the only way to experience the fullness of Christ. You are not going to experience God's fullness for your life and everything he intends until you give everything to him. Anything less, anything less is nothing. And see, so much of the church wants to play a game with God. I come to church, I, do, I give my tithes, I do a few things, but I don't really give it all. And then we wonder why the world looks at us and says, why would I want to be like that? And I'll never forget Bill Hybels brought his, uh, reading, listening to him talk in a, in a conference one time about when he was a young, young man, bringing some of his friends to church with him who were unsaved. And they went through the whole service and the sermon and everything. And after it was over, he asked the guys, well, what do you think? And one of them looked at him and said, uh, you do this every Sunday? And he said, well, yeah, every Sunday. He said, and then the guy responded to him, why would you put yourself through this every Sunday? Why would you put yourself through this? See, he, it was very evident that he saw nothing. Why would you do that? I wouldn't. I don't want that. I want a God who's alive. I want a God who's doing something. I want a God who's changing me. I want a God who's making me more like Christ. I want someone who's making a difference. I want God to make a difference in my life and in your life. I want you to come back a year from now and say, look what God did this year in me. Look at the character change in me. Look at the revolution that's gone in my heart. Look how my life has changed. Look at the things he set me free from. Look at the glory that has been revealed to me. Look at the people I've led to Jesus this year. Look what God has done. Now that's what Paul's talking about. Look what God has done. Not what, look what I've done, but look what God has done in my life. That's the commitment he's saying. That's the extent of the consecration. Its basis is the mercy of God. Its extent is everything. God does not want to see a half-hearted commitment from you. He really never really commits himself to that. It's interesting that in, in, this, in the, in the, um, in the, in the uh, Gospels, Jesus said, it said, I think it's in John, it said there are a lot of people following Jesus. And one of the things he said was, that he did not commit himself to them for he knew their hearts. If you aren't really dynamically following Christ, sensing him transforming you, he's not committing himself to you because you have not committed to him everything. God is looking for you to commit everything to him. So the extent is everything. The quality of your consecration is that it is an act of worship. We have a worship service here. You pray, you worship, you raise your hand sometimes, you clap your hands, you get excited, you listen to a message, you take notes, you think about things during the week, you read your Bible, but your act of worship 
the quality of it is that you bow your knee to God in everything. Now look at the results, and then we're going to finish here this morning. In verse 2, he says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. You want God's will in your life? You want to know what God wants you to do in your future? You want, God to know, you want God's will about issues in your life? It only comes by total commitment to him. Now, some people want to know God's will so they can evaluate it and decide whether they want to go or not. Last night I was reading a story about an old preacher who had uh, been preaching about uh, being committed to Christ, and in the middle of the message he talked about God would do whatever in your life. God would do great things in your life. When the sermon was all over, a little girl came up to him and said, well, I don't want to commit my life to Christ because he might send me to China. And he said, well, you know, wherever God intends to send you, uh, that's his desire. Your job is to commit your life to him. And she just shook her head, didn't want to do that, and walked away. Years later, this old preacher came back through, preaching again, and this young lady now walked up to him and said, do you remember me? And, she, and obviously he said, no. And the preacher said, well, uh, who are you? And she said, well, uh, you remember a little girl that came to you and said she didn't want to commit her life completely to, to Christ because she didn't want to go to China or something like that, that God would maybe send her there? And he said, oh, yes, I remember that. She said, I'm that girl. He said, well, that's wonderful. She said, you don't understand. He said, what don't I understand? And she said, I'm on my way to China. I'm on my way to China. He said, why? And he, he, she said, because after you left, I committed everything to Jesus. And now I want to go to China. Say, well, will God send everybody to China? No. But wherever he sends will be where you want to go. And whatever he does, it will be good. And whatever he wants to accomplish, it'll be right. And your mind will be renewed. You know what? She gave her life completely. She surrendered it all, and now she wants to go. She had her mind renewed. The result of giving over your life completely and every part of it is that you become in line with him, and you'll be able to prove his will. You'll know it. Now, if you're confused about God's will, you're not sure about God's will, mark it down. You're not doing verse 1. You commit and God will show. I'm not talking about everything. There are things ahead of you you're not sure of yet. Understand that. You know, some, some are younger and they don't know where they're going yet. Once you commit to Christ, he starts to show you his will and you'll be able to prove it and you'll know it and you'll know it. But it only comes as a result, it only comes as a result of total surrender to him. God is not interested in less than total surrender. That's what he wants. Now, the next, next in two weeks, maybe we'll look at some of the results of that, how it changes your relationships, how it changes your thoughts towards the world, how it changes your relationship to the authorities over you, and how it changes your relationship to other believers who disagree with you. Paul's going to go on and talk about if we're going to commit our lives, it makes a change in us. But it starts by a commitment based on the mercy of God. So let's bow our heads and let's pray this morning.